Welcome and thank you for joining part two of our webinar series, Commercial Litigation Outlook, Insights and Predictions for Litigation Trends in 2022. All participants are in listen-only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program through the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. If we run out of time, we will connect with you directly in the days following the webinar. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and presentation materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Sean Wood. Sean, you may begin. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, my name is Sean Wood, and I chair the Commercial Litigation Practice Group at Cypher Shaw. I want to welcome everyone to part two of our second annual Commercial Litigation Outlook, uh, where we forecast anticipated trends and challenges in key areas of commercial litigation we expect to see over the coming year, and hopefully provide some insights and strategies for meeting those challenges. We're thrilled to have such a tremendous turnout for today's webinar. And we have a full panel of speakers <clears throat> with ground to cover uh, and a limited time frame today. So uh, I'll start right out with introducing our first speaker, Chris Robertson. Uh, Chris serves as national chair of our whistleblower and corporate investigations team. He is also a veteran of the SEC and serves as a key member of our securities litigation and trial team. Chris will kick us off yeah, today. One. Reporting from the front line as trials resume and hybrid hearings persist in some parts of the country. Chris. Uh, thanks, everybody, and, and thanks for attending. Uh, we hope that you uh, take away some uh, key points from what we expect to happen over the next, you know, nine to 12 months uh, among all the practice groups, but also uh, in the courts. Um, and we encourage you to obviously, you know, read and and review the material, the written materials we put out. What I tried to do for today is, in addition to what we had talked about um, with regard to uh, what we knew a few months ago when we actually put the original materials together, is kind of update that and and see where we are because, as everyone knows, the way the courts have been operating is changing daily, um, and there's a lot of guidance that the courts are putting out. But the one thing that we, I think, now have all concluded uh, is that remote hearings, remote proceedings are going are going to be the new normal. Um, we are fairly confident, if not certain, that remote proceedings are here to stay. And the question is going to be what types of proceedings are going to be fully remote, what types of proceedings will be hybrid, and then which types of proceedings do we expect that, that courts will try to get people back in person. Um, it, it appears from our data and, and part of what I was fortunate enough to be able to review in advance of today are some studies. We're now actually seeing some studies coming out that have been able to collect data from 2020 and even parts of 2021 to understand some of the, you know, how the courts are operating to try to A, reduce their backloads and B, understanding how to use technology to more efficiently operate the courts and operate uh, court proceedings and trials. Um, just to give you some numbers, <clears throat> a recent study said that uh, upwards over 75% now of civil uh, hearings are being conducted remotely, virtually in some capacity. Um, and because of that, and because as with everything, people are getting more and more comfortable with the idea of remote hearings. People are getting more and more comfortable with the technology. Uh, people are getting more and more comfortable with how to present evidence, how to present witnesses through these technologies. Uh, we expect those kind of numbers to stay. Um, we expect that motions, case management conferences, things where people used to have to travel. So you might travel, you know, two hours or get on a plane for a 20 minute case management conference. Um, I think courts realize that there were huge inefficiencies in that. And so we expect that you know, many motion hearings, non-evidentiary motion hearings, even some evidentiary motion hearings, case management conferences, those kinds of things will remain remote and maybe fully remote um, in, unless it's truly, you know, down the street uh, kind of thing. Um, bench trials and evidentiary hearings, we expect those will be largely remote um, in that, you know, 75, maybe plus percent 
uh, of those types of hearings. Uh, just myself in the last couple of months, uh, I've had two fully remote uh, bench trials, uh, some remote arbitrations, remote mediations. And again, as everyone gets more and more comfortable with the technology, we're seeing that, that it's more and more likely that that's gonna continue. Um, it's interesting, I was able to pull uh, a order from the state courts of Michigan <clears throat> that just came out and it's a preliminary order, but it looks like it'll get entered. And um, they have specifically now said, and I'm quoting, trial courts are required, required to use remote participation technology to the greatest extent possible. So this is no longer you know, a convenience. This is something where because of the forced use of these technologies, um, the courts and, and legislatures are seeing that it just created such efficiencies for certain types of hearings. So there's going to be this mandate to utilize remote technologies to the extent possible because it reduces the cost to litigants, reduces cost to the courts, uh, creates efficiencies. So what's the counter to that? Well, the counter to that is there are some real concerns with certain evidentiary issues with remote proceedings. And having done now uh, maybe half a dozen or more of them during the, the pandemic, I, I can agree with certain of them. You know, cross-examination of witnesses, there are you know, concerns among the trial bar that are you really able to really uh, judge someone's credibility through a screen? Um, you know, a lot of us who've done this a long time, it's not just someone's facial expressions, it could be body movement, it could be shifting in a chair, it can be, are they looking at the ceiling? Are they looking at the wall? Are they looking at, you know, for help from their spouse that's sitting in the gallery? You know, there's a lot of things that can happen in a courtroom setting and in that with those mechanics and with how people physically interact that are really, you know, important part of sort of how a trial and the vibe, if you will, of a trial comes in. Um, also personal interaction with a jury <clears throat> or with the judge. Um, sort of making your point, not just with, you know, with questions or with the testimony that comes back, but with the way you ask, you know, and, and certainly tone will come through, but a lot of that body language, a lot of that interaction is lost in this environment. Now, that's not going to change anything to the extent that remote proceedings can still be remote. They're going to be, but it is something that is a concern and a criticism and probably a sufficient concern and criticism for criminal trials and particularly criminal jury trials that I think those are the most likely to try, most courts have, have, have stated that they're gonna to try to get those back live as soon as they can. Um, exhibits and document presentation. Again, in this survey <clears throat> that was submitted, you know, one of the concerns is obviously how do I, how do I protect my evidence until I'm ready to use it? So obviously if I'm gonna utilize some form of rebuttal document or I want to impeach someone with a document, you know, how do I confirm that I can have that available to them, but not necessarily have them have access to it before the hearing. So what we've seen is, for example, um, you know, with some government cases I've had, literally the documents will show up in a bag with a combination lock and the witness agrees and the parties agree that until that witness is on the stand and the judge or the or the hearing officer has has ordered them to open it, then they open the thing up and pull out the documents. Um, a lot of us have used pulling up documents on the screen. That's somewhat effective, but obviously you're scrolling. It's very hard sometimes to see an entire document on the screen uh, without a, the print being so small. And so oftentimes, you know, you lose that ability to have the context of a portion of a document within the entire document. So these are some of the things that are being worked through. Again, they do not seem dispositive to the issue of whether courts will largely continue to require in non-criminal matters that, that hearings be conducted remotely in some capacity, but these are the types of concerns that have been raised. Danielle, next slide. Um, and, and then I'll just quickly touch on um, sort of priorities. So there, there is a significant increase in backlog that's been caused by the pandemic. So there is this continuing pressure to resolve cases and move them along. We're seeing a lot of courts, you know, encouraging alternative dispute resolution, encouraging mediation to try to clear up their dockets. The other thing we've seen is remote jury selection and voir dire. 
So rather than bringing your jurors into court, uh, they've, they've attempted to do that remotely. So, you know, the jurors will get a jury notice and California got to a point where they, they had about an 85% response rate to jury notices. During the, the depths of the pandemic, it was down to just under 10% or around 10%. So they just couldn't get jurors. So they went to this remote jury selection and voir dire done remotely so people could do that at home, then bring the jurors in for live trial work. And that seems to have relieved some of that pressure. And obviously as the pandemic moves behind us, you know, we'll hope to see more uh, jury response, but I think some form of remote jury selection and remote questioning of jurors, either by writing or some form of video or Zoom is probably here to stay. And just very quickly, and then I'll, I'm up with my, my time, courtroom logistics and locations. We're still continuing to see public safety measures, alternative venues used. Uh, we talked about in, in the right written materials, using hotels, using commercial space. Uh, I have a case coming up in July. We're still looking for space uh, because we want something a little bit bigger. This is an administrative trial. It would normally be in a basically in a conference room. There are certain constituencies that aren't comfortable with that. Uh, another case we had, we had expected to do as a hybrid, but it turned out that our plaintiff was a uh, non-vaccinated um, individual. And so the, the venues would not let him uh, attend in person. So we moved to completely remote. So I think some of these issues are still safety issues, just general safety and protocol issues are still gonna be very much in play. And the last thing is uh, some pilot programs on jury trials, very mixed results. I think, um, you know, a fully remote jury trial, I think there's real concerns about, you know, keeping a juror's attention, having distractions as much as you can order them. Uh, the ability to not control a juror because they're not in your courtroom seems to be a, a driving concern. So I, I say mixed results because those are the studies, but I think largely what we're going to see to the extent there are actual jury trials, uh, courts are going to try to emphasize getting juries back in chairs getting and getting them live. And, and that's what we're going to see, I think, over the next 12 to 18 months. So thanks, Sean. I'll, I'll turn it over. I think I'm, I'm at my time, but I appreciate it. Okay. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to use the chat or uh, reach out to us after the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Our next speaker is uh, Caleb Schillinger. Caleb is a partner in our antitrust and competition group, and he will be addressing the changes he is seeing in the enforcement of federal antitrust laws in 2022. Caleb? Thanks very much, Sean. Danielle, if we go to the next slide, please. So with the change in administration came a change in the leadership at the two agencies principally responsible for enforcing the federal antitrust laws, the U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. And the new leadership signaled pretty quickly an intent through their actions and their external statements, including press releases, an intent to ramp up enforcement of those federal antitrust laws, including several provisions of the laws that in past administrations and decades haven't received much attention. So what we saw over the course of last year and it has continued into this year and fully expected to, to continue on for the rest of 2022 is a significant increase in enforcement efforts. And we've identified here some of the key areas that the two agencies are focused on. At the DOJ, they continue to prioritize investigations and criminal prosecutions of alleged collusion by employers, particularly in the areas of wage fixing and no poach. And so what we're talking about here are agreements between competitors to fix the wages that they pay their employees in order to artificially suppress those wages or to prevent turnover among their employees or agreements not to poach each other's employees. The Federal Trade Commission, there's been a lot of discussion in the press and a lot of attention paid to the increased scrutiny of proposed mergers but another area that is a focal point for them right now are quote unquote unlawful repair restrictions, meaning restrictions that companies place on the ability of independent service providers or customers to fix the products that those companies manufacture and sell. Danielle, if we go to the next slide, please. So we've laid out here some of the key milestones for the DOJ's criminal prosecutions of wage fixing and no poach agreements. It really starts back in 2016 when the DOJ issued its antitrust guidance for human resource professionals. 
and warned companies pretty clearly that the DOJ would be willing to bring criminal charges against those companies and individuals that engage in naked wage fixing or no poach agreements. And again, what we're talking about here is horizontal conduct. So conduct between competitors at the same level of the supply chain. And at the end of 2020 and continuing into 2021, the DOJ made good on that threat and brought its first criminal prosecutions, a case based on wage fixing down in the Eastern District of Texas, and a case based on an alleged no poach agreement in the District of Colorado. Now, just two weeks ago, uh, those cases uh, resulted in jury verdicts acquitting the individuals and companies of those charges. There was a conviction for an obstruction of investigation charge, but on the core allegations of unlawful antitrust conduct, the defendants were found not guilty, um, which surprised a lot of folks watching those cases because there was evidence of some pretty damning internal emails and conversations among the defendants talking about fixing wages or agreeing not to poach each other's employees. And I think, you know, them being jury verdicts, it's difficult to know what was persuasive to the jury or not and what ultimately uh, pushed them to find the defendants not to be guilty. But it is, you know, a reminder that antitrust violations can be very difficult to prove. But notwithstanding that, the DOJ remains very much committed to investigating these sorts of allegations and bringing these types of prosecutions as reflected by a comment that we have here the head of the DOJ Antitrust Division, Jonathan Cantor, was recently reported as saying at an antitrust conference at the University of Chicago, I'm here to declare that we're not part of the chicken shit club, um, which I actually had to look up, but apparently is a reference to a 2018 publication uh, criticizing the DOJ at the time for what was perceived to be lax enforcement of white collar um, violations. And you know the head of the division went on to say, these cases are important because they establish harm to workers as an antitrust harm. Specifically, in both of these cases, the defendants brought motions to dismiss that were unsuccessful, and the courts held that the alleged harm could in fact be a per se violation of the antitrust laws. And so notwithstanding the not guilty verdicts ultimately in those two cases, the DOJ is emboldened by the fact that they survived motions to dismiss and they now have decisions holding that this type of conduct, at least in theory, could be a per se violation of the antitrust laws. And I think the important takeaway here for companies is the importance of one, having an antitrust compliance policy and two, making sure that they train on that policy regularly. Uh, to ensure that their employees are aware of the policy and what is or is not permissible conduct. Because having such a policy and actually training on it, ensuring that it's not simply a paper tiger, can be important at the charging stage. And the DOJ will take that into account when making a decision about whether or not to pursue a possible prosecution against a company that's involved in this type of conduct. Danielle, if we go to the next slide. On the FTC side, in terms of unlawful repair restrictions, the impetus largely for this was the executive order on promoting competition that President Biden issued last July and that called on all agencies across the federal government to combat perceived excessive concentration of industry and market power abuses in a variety of markets, including what specifically called out repair markets. Hot on the heels of that, the FTC issued its own policy statement in which it said it would scrutinize repair restrictions for violations of the antitrust laws and that it would be prioritizing investigations into those types of restrictions. Now, this largely builds off of the work that the FTC had done previously in its nixing the fix workshop and a subsequent report to Congress in which it addressed some of these practices restricting competition for repair services. If you haven't had an opportunity or aren't familiar with the Nixing the Fix workshop and report, I highly recommend taking a look at it. It's very insightful uh, and, and provides some excellent perspectives into how the agency views these types of restrictions and what they're looking at specifically. And we've identified here two examples of the types of physical or technological or supply chain restrictions that they're focused on. And two big takeaways in terms of these repair restrictions are one, for those companies that do impose restrictions on their products and, and repairing those products, it's an opportunity to review written warranties that they may have and the internal policies and procedures for those warranties 
to ensure compliance with some of the key laws, including the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act and the other federal antitrust laws to ensure that they don't unintentionally include some tying arrangements or other provisions uh, that are potentially in violation of those laws. And with respect to any restriction, I think it's important for the company to ask itself, what is the purpose or the reason for this particular restriction to ensure that it's not only not pretextual, but also that it's not what we would say is unexamined. In other words, that there is a reason for the restriction. It's backed up by empirical evidence. We're not simply saying it's a safety concern. We've really looked into it. We've probed behind it. And important too is know what you have said in your internal emails and documents about this particular restriction because those materials are obviously going to be an important part of the record for any sort of enforcement action or investigation and you want to ensure that those documents are consistent with what externally is being uh, used to justify the restriction daniel next slide please and so just to finish up uh, in terms of the ftc's heightened scrutiny of uh, mergers uh, again, largely a function of the change in leadership at the FTC, and there have been a number of policy reversals and changes to the procedure for submitting pre-merger notification review to the agency that many commentators have said is creating greater uncertainty, raising transaction costs, and heightened risk for companies seeking to enter into a merger. The first is in early uh, February of last year, the agency suspended its practice of granting early termination of the 30-day waiting period. In the past, where parties submitted a pre-merger notification review, the agency looked at it quickly and determined that there were not competitive concerns. They would grant early termination where requested and allow the parties to move forward with consummating the transaction. That practice has been suspended. It was supposed to be temporary, but more than a year later, it remains in place uh, and there is no indication from the agency when it might resume granting early termination. The FTC and now also the DOJ have also started a practice of issuing these close at your own risk letters that inform merging parties that where the agencies haven't been able to complete their investigation uh, within the 30 day period. Uh, they retain the right to challenge that transaction after the fact. That's somewhat gratuitous because the agencies always retain the ability to challenge a transaction afterward, but are now alerting parties that if they move forward, even though the agency hasn't completed its investigation, they're doing so at their own risk. Uh, and as we note there, the FTC has also rescinded some important policy documents that really provided guidance to parties as to how the agency would approach a proposed merger, what analytical framework or methodology it would use to evaluate it, including the vertical merger guidelines that the FTC issued jointly with the DOJ in 2020. The FTC is currently uh, holding a number of workshops or listening sessions to gather input from stakeholders uh, in order to issue revised guidelines. And there's been some suggestion that they're going to do away entirely with the construct of vertical guidelines versus horizontal guidelines and instead combine both into a single set uh, of principles for uh, parties to look at, um, as well as a 2015 statement of enforcement principles that really cabined the agency's exercise of its authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act. And again, the takeaway here is that across sectors and industries, uh, given the current enforcement regime, companies should expect that a review of proposed merger will involve heightened scrutiny and may take longer, including the issuance of an access letter or a second request. So with that, Sean, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Sean, you're on mute. My apologies. Uh, Caleb, just real quickly, um, the, you mentioned the increased scrutiny uh, for potential tying arrangements under Magnuson Moss, and, and that relates to, to clarify uh, to consumer goods, correct? That's exactly right, Sean. Yeah, the scope of Magnuson Moss applies only to consumer products. The statute defines it as any tangible personal property that's um, normally used for personal, family, or household purposes. And I think the key there is, you know, whether or not a product is a consumer product is really a question of fact. Um, and depends on uh, whether or not that use is quote unquote not uncommon, but a great, great point. You're right. That particular uh, restriction on tying arrangements applies to consumer products. Thanks a lot. Uh, now, our next speaker is Chris, Christine Argentine. Christine is a partner in our Chicago office and serves as national chair of our consumer class action defense team. 
She'll be sharing her insights on the increase in consumer class action filings over the last year, uh, which seems to be continuing. Christine? Thanks, Sean. Yeah, so, you know, recently I attended a conference where the FTC and the DOJ and a bunch of state AGs uh, made clear that from both an investigative and an enforcement standpoint, this administration is going to focus on consumer protection and consumer privacy. And part of that is kind of the data collection that we're seeing and that a lot of companies are getting excited about and wondering, you know, how can they capitalize this and what exactly can they do with it? Um, and as part of kind of this insight into the data collections, the plaintiff's bar has gotten super creative. And one of the trends we saw last year that we expect to continue this year is on um, what was known as wiretap cases. So the plaintiff's bar was taking old wiretap statutes and basically applying them to, to newer technology. They were bringing class actions against major retailers and businesses um, based on their websites and based on the technology used on the websites that was kind of tracking likes and clicks and where what types of product people were looking at. Now, many of those cases were um, defeated on a motion to dismiss, which tended to turn on how the statute defined electronic communications and interception, right? Again, because they're trying to use an older statute to fit into newer technology that the statute really didn't comp contemplate at the times that they were drafted. Um, but recently, in February of this year, one of the leading internet providers who was hit with one of these uh, proposed a national class action settlement for about $90 million. And so that settlement could definitely reinvigorate the plaintiff's bar around these cases and, and to look at how they can continue to use these wiretap statutes on the data that's being collected on websites. Another area of focus um, is the new biometric protection statutes and ordinances that are going into place. Um, that without any sort of comprehensive federal legislation, the um, that governs kind of the collection of consumer data and the collection of biometrics. We've seen a major push in the last years that has continued into 2022 where states are enacting their own statutes. And the result is a patchwork of requirements that differ across states, making it really difficult for companies to keep up and to understand how they're complying depending on which states they're operating in and what needs to be done. Some of the states that we are looking to that are pretty close to enacting new statutes is the is Maryland. We also want to watch and see how New York's new statute plays. Um, but all in all, there's 15 pending legislations right now. 15 states have pending legislation on that touch to um, biometrics in some way. 10 states have existing legislations. Now they differ in terms of whether or not there's a private right of action or the breadth of the statute. Um, and some of the newer statutes are kind of trending towards a hybrid approach that mix the concepts of traditionally um, that have been traditionally associated with biometric privacy and then consumer privacy statutes. So it's a really interesting area of law that's been developing um, that companies have, I know, been struggling to kind of keep up with and make sure that they are in compliance with. Um, and that will continue because these state statutes continue to be passed. Now, the FTC has said that they are considering exercising their rulemaking authority in a way that will cover privacy, biometrics, cybersecurity, but that's yet to be seen how that will be done. Now, one of the, the more prevalent and, and longer existing biometric statutes is obviously the Illinois Biometric Privacy Statute. And recently, the Illinois Supreme Court um, issued a decision in February that foreclosed a major defense there on based on the workers' comp exclusivity. And so many, many cases that have been stayed that were under the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act um, are now coming, um, being, you know, re- re-put into litigation, right? Those those days have been lifted. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Next slide. So data breach and privacy class actions is another trend we um, expect to see to continue over the next year. The data breach events um, has been on the rise year over year, and it's been it's up 14% in quarter one of 2022. So we can expect class actions to flow from those. Um, and 92% of those new data breach events are a result of cyber attacks. Um, not surprisingly, this has led to continued class actions. And a lot of these class actions are relied on common law um, causes of action, like negligence or fraud. Some of them are statute-based, but mostly they're common law. 
Um, and we expect that the plaintiff's bar will continue to kind of plead novel um, theories with respect to class actions in, in the data breach space because they can be a little bit difficult to plead. Now, some of the key litigation trends that we expect to see in 2022 um, are, again, challenges to Article 3 standing. We know that speculative future harm um, has been said not to be not to allow for Article Three standing, and so the so courts will continue to look at what that is, including kind of a scrutiny in terms of the type of information taken and whether that's likely or could be used um, or misused rather to the detriment of the consumer, and so whether or not that creates speculative harm. Another issue is causation. And can the plaintiff show a nexus between the data breach at issue and the information taken? In other words, could the compromised information be a result of a different data breach? And can the plaintiff show that their, his or her information is on the dark web because of this specific data breach? Some courts have been dismissing on that, on that issue alone. And then obviously a continued dispute over work product doctrine and whether or not post breach forensic reports were done as a business review or truly in anticipation of litigation. So when a cyber attack happens, um, companies need to be very careful about how they're directing uh, reports to occur and in thinking about how they can protect those under the work product doctrine if that's something that they're looking to do. Next slide. So the last area that we, we expect in the consumer space um, to continue is obviously Telephone Consumer Protection Act with the very high statutory damages and uh, you know a, ability to collect treble damages. This is gonna be continue to be a focus. Now there's a bit of a shift in focus. They are focusing more on ringless voicemails and pre-recorded messages based on the Supreme Court's decision last year on the, on, um, the ATDS and more on technical aspects of the TCPA, like violations of the do not call registry, but we expect these will continue. Um, the re reassigned number database recently um, went into effect that provides a safe harbor in case your company is calling someone whose number has been reassigned. There's been some updates to that, but that's just up and running. So we will watch that to see how that plays out and how courts feel about defenses under the reassigned number database. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is the mini TCPA statutes. So several states, um, Florida has already enacted theirs, have mini TCPA statutes that are like the TCPA, but drafting around, for instance, the ATDS issue. So some states to watch are Oklahoma, Georgia, Washington, all of them are thinking about um, enacting mini TCPA statutes that then could also be bring uh, plaintiffs could also bring violations under those, and you have to make sure that you're in compliance with those statutes as well. So I'll turn it back over to Sean for our next speaker. Thanks so much, Christine. Our, our next speaker is David Bazaar. David is a region to the American College of Consumer Financial Services Lawyers, and he chairs uh, CIFAR's Consumer Financial Services Litigation Group. Uh, David's going to be talking about what to expect this year in terms of both government enforcement litigation and civil litigation and class action. David. Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, good afternoon if you're uh, in the Eastern time zone, and good morning if you're anywhere else. Um, so the, we're a busy space these days uh, in consumer finance with you know, a lot of shifts in the economy and, of course, with a change um, of administration, and um, we've got a lot going on. So I've got five and a half minutes to cover a huge waterfront, but I'm just going to going to try to keep it compact for you. So on the government side, you know, we've got a lot of agencies here. We've got the Department of Justice, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. We've got the FTC. Those are just the federal ones. Then we've got the AGs uh, in the states. We've got state banking regulators. Wow. You know, there's a lot of regulation and a lot of regulators that, uh, that exist to get in trouble with. So where, what's the stuff that should be keeping you up at night? Um, well, in, in a word, it's redlining. Um, so what, what our... Uh, Everybody is very interested in these days is that equity, uh, that equity word, and equity is finding itself to be uh, all over the the, uh, the lending space. You know, making sure that people can get affordable loan products, that they're not overcharged on the front or the back end for the use of those loan products, uh, and that they're getting them in a fair uh, way in which 
uh, it's not being held against them that they might come from a particular racial group or ethnic group or, uh, uh, you know, where these used to be relatively simple, like that redlining was uh, land and zip codes and where people live and, and those types of things. You know, today it is this, uh, this algorithm uh, issue is what, is what a lot of our government agencies are very focused on. It is sort of this black box of like how do these uh, computers make these decisions about who gets credit and who doesn't and how expensive it is for them. Um, and being able to, if you have a regulator come and knock on your door, if you're in this space, to be able to justify and explain, which is often difficult because these decisions are made on neutral criteria, but they may be made in a, in a way in which does not uh, does not employ them neutrally as far as the government's concerned. So anyway, that's, that's one of the hottest spaces right now and will continue to be. Another super hot space is medical debt and uh, will continue to be throughout this year. Everyone is very focused on it. We've got big changes going on with the uh, credit reporting agencies as to what they can report and when they can report it uh, and, and how you can collect it. There's just a lot going on there. Um, and. Uh, uh, and then credit reporting in general is, is always, uh, always a big space here. For, so you've also got mortgages and, you know, coming out of the, uh, the CARES Act forbearance and how's the credit recorded and with, with somebody holding a forbearance against the borrower. All those types of things are very active with, with these government uh, regulators that, uh, that, that tread in those spaces. Um, the FTC, while it's not a, a uh, finance regulator per se, still has a, a fair amount of overlap in, in, in uh, much of this space, and uh, particularly on fintechs. And they are uh, asserting their Section 51, 5M1B authority these days after they lost that Supreme Court case, that AMG uh, capital management case um, that, uh, that, that struck down their, their typical monetary penalty authority. Well, they're back under this, what well, was an old authority that they used to exercise their penalty offense authority under this uh, other section of the FTC Act, so uh, they haven't gone away. Um, so that uh, that's what's going on mostly in the government space. On the civil litigation side, it's still relatively slow, historically speaking. Uh, this work tends to ramp up in uh, the middle to the tail end of recessions. Uh, a lot of civil litigation and class actions in the consumer finance space are driven by distressed consumer debt. And here we have housing uh, that is becoming uh, an issue finally. Uh, where Housing prices have been uh, reaching historic highs. Perhaps they're now uh, sliding downward. We have inflation that is uh, it's significant. We, we will soon have and have already started. We're up over a point and a half of rising interest rates. We're going to see those continue to go up very substantially. As you see, all of these market forces start driving towards uh, uh, folks towards uh, distressed debt, you'll start seeing distressed debt spinoff litigation. So expect to see that. Uh, as we start to get towards the end of this year, and especially as we go into next year, um, this is an area that's going to get significantly busier. Um, and that includes foreclosures. Uh, and just before we go to the next slide real quick, that, that includes uh, foreclosures. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks thought that we were going to get this huge uh, influx of foreclosures coming out of the CARES Act. I was not one of them. I, I had been predicting that, you know, the moral hazard that had existed in the past that that uh, stopped a lot of these financial institutions from just, you know, forgiving everybody's uh, uh, defaulted debt. This didn't exist for COVID, and the government was going to put a lot of pressure on folks, et cetera. And sure enough, you know, we have a basically historic low of, uh, of loans coming out of forbearance in, in a problem setting. So they're being modified and taken care of. We're not seeing a lot of litigation that way. Student loan forbearance has been extended until August 31st. And will it be kicked again? Uh, we'll see. I, I personally think probably not. This is probably the last time, but, uh, you know, who knows? Next slide, please. And then finally, the, we've got the fintechs. And so for fintechs, we've got uh, a lot going on with them. They're really a, a growing space. There's a lot of money pouring into fintechs. They have very novel products, and they tend to have not so, not so good compliance. And that's a recipe for litigation, and it's a recipe for having regulators take an increased interest. And so I'll just finish by saying we've got, there's my timer, look, I set one, <laughs> that we've got, uh, we've got folks in both areas, both the regulators and the plaintiff's bars taking notice, and we can expect to see some, some substantially increased enforcement uh, class actions uh, as well uh, coming into that space, I think, as we get later into 2022 and 2023. That's it.
Thanks so much, David. Uh, at this time, I wanted to announce the CLE number for today's webinar. Please write this down uh, if you wish to submit for uh, attendance credits. The CLE code for today's uh, commercial ed outlook webinar is SS2763, that's SS2763. Uh, our next speaker is Jonathan Brownstein. John is a partner in our San Francisco office and has served in various leadership roles with the American Bar Association's committees uh, with respect to healthcare and disability insurance. John will be providing this year's outlook in connection with healthcare, healthcare litigation. John. Thank you, Sean. All right, uh, key trends in healthcare litigation. Um, not surprisingly, um, COVID-19 has <laughs> Uh, certain, certainly focused all of us on the areas of healthcare and healthcare litigation uh, in particular. Uh, and we've, we're going to go through five areas here today. And all of these areas will be hot in, in 2022 and beyond. And they are at least in part, uh, you know, driven by the, you know, uh, ripples or tidal wave ripples, uh, you know, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for, so, you know, quick five is False Claims Act investigation and litigation. Uh, then we'll talk briefly on federal and state privacy laws. Um, litigation surrounding vaccination requirements, uh, antitrust litigation, uh, and non-compete and employee mobility litigation. Uh, first, False Claims Act. So um, the Federal False Claims Act, or the FCA, uh, is the gov federal government's primary tool to combat and fight uh, what it perceives to be healthcare fraud. Um, it is also a great driver of revenue uh, for the federal government. Um, and when in doubt, I always say, follow the money. Um, and it is no surprise that the False Claims Act, and frankly, the Biden administration has said expressly and unequivocally that it is going to use the False Claims Act um, as a tool um, to go after, um, you know, perceived fraud uh, in connection with econ economic stimulus programs uh, of the last couple of years. So, you know, you guys may remember PPP, right? The Paycheck Protection Program. Um, there was, you know, that and other similar programs. There was uh, perceived to be a lot of fraud. Um, and now, you know, the, the reckoning is coming. And the federal government is going to want to come back and see if they can recover uh, some funds. And, and, and frankly, uh, President Biden mentioned it in his State of the Union. So he's on record that he's going to go after this. Uh, just to give you some quick stats for background, I mean, 2020 was a down year in FCA um, enforcement and recoveries because obviously the government was closed, businesses were closed, litigation wasn't happening. But in 2020, the federal government recovered $2.2 billion in FCA recoveries. In the first quarter of 2021 alone, that number uh, increased by a billion dollars to over 3.2 billion. Um, Delta slowed things down a little bit mid-year, but in the end of the year, there was another billion dollars uh, in recoveries. Um, so you can see that the numbers are pretty big. Um, and in, in not surprisingly, a disproportionate amount of the dollars and the investigations and the recoveries uh, are in the healthcare space. Um, you know, this is going to continue um, in, in false claims act actions going forward. Uh, either actions that the government initiates itself uh, or actions that are initiated by um, essentially private plaintiffs in the name of the government um, called key TAM plaintiffs or key TAM relators. Um, you know, again, there's big dollars here. It's low hanging fruit, particularly in healthcare, and there's no signs of it um, slowing down. Uh, second, right, um, federal and state privacy laws. Um, you know, under the Biden administration, there's there's certainly a renewed emphasis on consumer protection. Um, we've talked in terms of cybersecurity. We've talked about you know data, data security. Um, certainly in the healthcare space, uh, this is a particular concern. Um, certainly, the big federal law right is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, affectionately known to all of us as HIPAA. And of course, that's H I P A A. Um, if you see someone spell it H I P P A, that's a big bright light that they don't know what they're talking about, and there may be some fraud, waste, and abuse in play. But that's the subject for a, a different discussion another day. So certainly, you know, HIPAA is the big federal law, but, um, you know, we anticipate that HIPAA related claims will continue to increase. Um, one driver, right, of, of some of these uh, privacy and federal and state privacy law issues in healthcare um, is the increased use of telehealth and corresponding, you know, perceived actual or, or real, um, you know, perceived or actual HIPAA violations and fraudulent activity um, seeking to compromise or access uh, private information. Um, HIPAA and federal law is only, you know, part of the story. Um, certainly another piece of it is state laws. And there has been a recent trend that states have enacted and more are in the process of enacting a very broad and expansive um, consumer protection statutes focused specifically on uh, data security and um, personal information privacy. And not surprisingly, again, these are often focused in um, you know, the healthcare space. So, for example, Texas has a pretty broad law that covers not just healthcare organizations, but anyone who comes into possession of a personal of personal healthcare information. 
Um, I'm out in California. Not surprisingly, California is a trailblazer in consumer uh, protection statutes, and we have at least three on the books. You know, that govern healthcare. We have what's called the CMI, CMIA, California Medical uh, Information Act. We've got the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, and the C CPRA, the California Privacy Rights Act. And all of these have, you know, broad consumer protections. And I think the, the questions, right, for litigation is really going to be what is the scope and enforceability of these statutes, um, and by who, right? Can private actors bring them, or are these going to be mostly left up to government regulators to enforce them? Uh, next, vaccine requirements. So certainly some of the highest profile uh, litigation in 2021 related to vaccine requirements uh, imposed on healthcare workers and others by federal, state, and local governments. Um, all of this litigation is happening against the backdrop of, um, you know, vaccine mandates, um, you know, and carve out, right, exceptions for, um, you know, medical conditions or religious beliefs. Um, you know, certainly all these, these laws were, were tested um, in, in, in state and federal courts, you know, throughout the country and continue to do so. Um, you know, certain rules issued by the Centers for Medical uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, have been under a lot of scrutiny. Um, and, you know, we, we anticipate that, you know, th these things are still going. There are still procedural and substan uh, substantive issues on the, you know, question of vaccine mandates and then whether states can impose laws that block vaccine mandates. So, you know, there's just a host of litigation continues. Um, litigation over what constitutes appropriate accommodations based on medical conditions or religious beliefs. Um, litigation over whether, you know, federal law and rules preempt state law and rules, including, as I just mentioned, you know, does federal rules preempt state law rules that prohibit vaccination requirements? So, you know, just a lot of tongue twisters there, but just a lot of work that still exists in, uh, you know, the area of vaccine requirements. Um, last, and, and I'll do these briefly and together, you know, antitrust litigation, as well as non-compete and employee mobility litigation. Uh, I would double down on Caleb's uh, excellent antitrust presentation uh, earlier in this program. And, you know, the first thing Caleb talked about was these, you know, DOJ and criminal enforcements. And I would just point out that both of those cases that uh, Caleb discussed were in the healthcare context. So again, kind of like False Claims Act, healthcare industry in particular is a driving focus, not only of False Claims Act work, but also antitrust litigation and you've seen a lot of it, frankly, involving non-competes and employee mobility litigation. Um, Caleb obviously talked about some of the government issues, but note that these also involve um, litigations between private actors, right, that are brought by private companies. Just to give you a couple examples, right, private nurses or home health care, um, any sort of healthcare industry or organization where there are uh, multiple, you know, lots of employers with, that have, uh, you know, subcontractors that work for, for various, you know, companies. And so there's a lot of fighting over, you know, wages and mobility. Uh, et cetera, both government and private. Um, and that's what I've got. And I will uh, send it back to you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. I see some questions just clarifying the CLE code again. That is SS2763, SS2763. Um, uh, our next speaker is Tom Locke. Tom chairs our Washington, uh, D.C. practice group and serves as co-chair of our insurance group. And he'll be addressing cyber insurance and data breach coverage issues in 2022. So, um, first of all, congratulations to everyone on staying this long. Uh, this is the highlight of your presentation. This is the one you've all been waiting for. I appreciate Sean's enthusiasm in his introduction. I'll try to make it a brief and informative. Um, as Chris Robertson pointed out earlier, you never know what you're getting when you're doing a, um, a, a presentation that's remote. You don't know if your humor is working or not. So I'm gonna assume that it's not working and I'll just go on to the merits. Um, the, you know, as the slide indicates, there's a number of issues that are coming up in 2022 and come up so far. Um, probably the biggest issue, and I'm going to be talking about this in a moment, is the limited coverage that's available in some areas. I'll get to that in a second. Other new things happening in 2022, if you're involved in a merger and acquisition, over half of those now have representations and warranties insurance in, involved, and the claims are starting to come. And what's interesting about these claims is because the RWI policies are so new, um, we're really seeing a lot of developments. Courts aren't quite sure what to do with the coverage issues yet. 
the policies are unique, so that could be interesting. Climate change coverage uh, issues, that's coming, and well, it's, it's ongoing, and it um, likely will be for years and years to come. Uh, look to your traditional policies and look for renewals that exclude uh, coverage for climate change. We'll come back to that in a minute. Sexual molestation coverage litigation continues. The Big Boy Scouts um, case in Delaware, the bankruptcy is a big one. There are a number of other uh, pedophilia type cases that are out there and the coverage litigation goes hand in hand with those bankruptcies. Uh, along with that, you have asbestos and mass tort bankruptcies, lots and lots of those. They never seem to go away. Um, we're seeing more asbestos like uh, mass tort bankruptcies, so expect that to continue and a move past even secondary defendants to more tertiary defendants. Finally, in terms of developments, COVID-19, there were a lot of business interruption lawsuits that were filed in, 20, in 2020, 2021. Those, um, the insurers have won and likely will continue to win. Uh, unfortunately, if you're a policyholder, the only thing I can say is I hope that you, uh, if you file that litigation, uh, the attorney was representing you on a contingency fee basis because the likelihood of recovery, at least thus far, has been remote. Um, some big cases coming up. I'm getting a warning, uh, wrap it up. And I haven't even got to my second slide. So on to the second slide. Um, so uh, 2021 was a very hard market in, in insurance terms. That means uh, high premiums uh, reduce coverage. 2022, there's a lot of money out there uh, in part because the stock market um, and even though with the heightened uh, inflation, there's still a lot of money out there to write policies. So expect things to soften somewhat on your renewals and your new coverage, but there are some exceptions and I've listed them there. I won't belabor it. Um, I'll come to cyber uh, in a moment. I do want to say that the professional liability coverage, errors and omissions coverage, tough year this year, uh, underwriters are just disinclined to write. And because of the increased environmental activity, property insurance in the West and in the South, where you see hurricanes, um, that's gonna be tough. In the West, it's the firestorms. Let's uh, move to the next slide. So with the cyber policies, this is a very, very hard market. Um, best case scenario are premium increases in the numbers that I list there. What uh, policyholders should be looking for on renewal is where else their coverage might be limited. It's not just a premium increase. It's reduced coverage in lots of areas I list some there, but you're gonna to have to read the proposals very closely because the goal that the insurers have is to reduce the number of, or the amount of money spent responding to uh, cyber events, like hiring of attorneys, accountants, and experts. Uh, so just be prepared for reductions in coverage in addition to increases in premium um, you know, work with your broker closely to make sure you understand what's being proposed because chances are it's going to be a lot lower. Final slide, please. Danielle, could you go to the final slide? Okay, well, I'm not sure quite why we're not there, but in any case, what, I'd, uh, what I want to cover is just Two points. Uh, one, there are two types of coverage that you have. You see it there, first party and third party. Uh, you wanna make sure you've got both types of coverage. Uh, I, I always 
add points to the things I want to say, so I'll make it three points. Second is, in addition to your cyber policies, look at your other coverage. There might be hidden cyber coverage in the event that you experience a loss. Uh, it could be in the first party type policies. It could be in some of your specialty lines policies. The third thing I want to point out is, so what do you do if you're trying to get coverage or you need to renew? The main advice, in addition to working closely with your broker, is best practices. Make sure that your cyber policies, meaning not insurance coverage, but your protections uh, are in place. You really need to show underwriters that you have thought about your cyber risk for whatever industry you're in, and you've protected to the greatest extent possible those risks uh, and potential losses to avoid the ransomware that we know has been increasing in the past and likely will continue in the future. So with that, let me turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Tom. Uh uh, next up, uh, we have Talat Ansari, who serves as national co-chair of our International Dispute Resolution Group, and Talat will be sharing his insights on the increase in international arbitration activity that he anticipates over the coming years. Talat? Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience and listening to all of us. I have just three minutes to go and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I believe that 2022 is going to be an extremely interesting uh, year for decisions, major decisions coming down from the United States Supreme Court. And I'll be quick and I want to highlight at least four issues that are going to be examined by the court and finally decided by them. And we look forward to that. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is a provision of Washington state law, which uh, prohibits the uh, arbitration in a contract that relates to insurance. And uh, the uh, Washington Supreme Court has held that uh, insurance contracts cannot be arbitrated, and they have to be decided by courts. There was a hurricane that came and hit uh, the uh, Washington coast, which led to damage to a number of homes. And most of the homeowners had uh, insurance with Lloyd's of England, which uh, uh, had arbitration provisions. So uh, the, uh, all the uh, people whose homes were hurt or uh, destroyed uh, sued them in state court. And the case went all the way up to the Washington Supreme Court, which held that these contracts are not enforceable. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, arbitration clauses were therefore disregarded. And what happened was that the uh, uh, that suits were filed to recover the uh, amounts that were due to the insured. The uh, in insurance company, mostly Lloyd's, filed a litigation in the uh, district court alleging that this was not valid and that the court has to enforce the arbitration clause. And it was a clear-cut issue on whether a decision by the district court can disregard the law as laid down by the state courts. And clearly, they cannot do that. However, there was there was ingenuity in the argument of Lloyd's, and they said that this bar is caused uh, exists because it cannot be enforced because it is in violation of the provisions of the of the uh, Convention on Recognition of Enforcement of Awards, which is be, being approved by the executive, and it's not in violation of the. Uh, of the uh, US, uh, district, uh, of, of the state laws. The case went up all the way to the Ninth Circuit, and Ninth Circuit took the view that since there is arbitration clause and that arbitration clause 
is not violating any provisions of the federal law, and it's pursuant to enforced pursuant to the Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Awards, which is an international convention signed by multiple companies. Uh, the arbitration provision can be enforced by Lloyds. This Supreme Court has granted cert, and this will be an interesting case to watch. The second interesting case, which is pending before uh, the Supreme Court, arises from an Eighth Circuit decision, which basically negated the power of the court to dismiss a suit because the, and send it to arbitration because the uh, plaintiffs had not asked for arbitration at that stage. The question there was, uh, can uh, arbitration be disallowed if there is a clause and if the plaintiff doesn't exercise his clause and waives the right? And that too was decided by the court, by Eighth Circuit, to hold that the provision of law is valid and that no arbitration can be held at this stage. The third case I want to go through is very interesting. Uh, it's a case against the uh, state of Nigeria. A, a company based in England entered into a contract with the Nigerian government to refine natural gas and supply natural gas to, uh, for the generation of electricity to electric plants in, US, in, in Nigeria. Of course, the uh, never went forward because the Nigerian government was not supplying the raw natural gas uh, to these people. There was an arbitration clause and they sued under the arbitration clause and took the matter to arbitration in London. And the London arbitration body awarded about $10 billion to the plaintiffs in, for violation, violating their obligations, uh, Nigeria violating its obligations and not supplying natural gas. Uh, Nigeria filed an appeal against that order in Britain, claiming that this uh, order was wrong and contrary to laws. That decision has not yet been taken, and the, uh, all the matters which uh, are pending are still in court in uh, Britain. In the meanwhile, the plaintiff came to the, the district court in Washington and claimed that it's entitled to the award based on uh, Nigeria's decision uh, to not supply and also because the arbitrators had come to a definite conclusion. DC court, interestingly, uh, Nigeria came to DC court and it took a view that it's immune from these proceedings because it's, it has sovereign immunity and the FSIA. Uh, interestingly, the court followed a decision of, and this is not the first time this has happened, followed a decision of the Second Circuit where the Second Circuit had said that, look, there's a New York Convention on Arbitration and any country which signs the New York Convention has waived its right to claim sovereign, uh, so sovereign immunity, which is strange because most of the countries in the world have signed that uh, convention. And uh, it implies that the uh, whichever country has signed that convention is not entitled to claim sovereign immunity. Second Circuit has also taken the same view. And the uh, decision is before the Supreme Court to decide whether sovereign immunity is waived by a country merely because they have signed this convention. And last but not the least, which is a very interesting provision for our, our, uh, to our litigators in international arbitration, is a section of the uh, US 28, 28 US code that uh, US 1782, which entitles the district court to allow a person in a foreign arbitration 
to go ahead and take the positions of a party which is based resident of US if it is involved in that provision. And there's a big amount of you know controversy over this. Different courts have taken different views. More specifically, three courts, Second Circuit, Seventh Circuit, and Fifth Circuit have held that the provision can be invoked only in cases where there is a sovereign or a official body deciding the, uh, the dispute overseas. The term used in the, uh, in the uh, provision is, uh, says pending in foreign or international tribunal. And the view is foreign or international tribunal, the courts that have decided against appointing uh, and giving discovery, have said that this only means that it can be applied in cases where the decision is being taken overseas by a, a, either an official tribunal or a quasi-judicial body, and not if it's a commercial private trans, uh, arbitration. The, the six, the, 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 there have been six, five decisions, uh, one by the Second Circuit, which, which has taken that view, second by the Fifth Circuit, which has taken the view, third, the, the Seventh Circuit, which has taken that view, that it's not available in commercial arbitrations. Fortunately, for those who use that provision fairly often, both Fourth Circuit and Sixth Circuit have decided against that and said, no, the words used are not just restricted to the, uh, to the official quasi-judicial bodies, but can also be used because it says foreign or international tribunal. And tribunal really is a broad term. It doesn't have to be a body which is you know, quasi-judicial or a body which is governmental, it, it can be used as arbitration. The arbitrators also act like a tribunal. The court granted cert. This case has been just heard last month, and we look forward to a decision because it can give rise to a lot of arbitrations, uh, a lot of discovery in cases where U.S. parties are involved overseas. I think I've taken more than my time. No, we, we thank you very much, Talad. I appreciate it. And our, our final speaker is Elizabeth Scherrero. Uh, Elizabeth is a partner in our New York office, and she co-chairs our real estate litigation practice group. I know that real estate litigation is, has been one of the hottest areas, and so I know our time is over. And I uh, expect in the coming uh, weeks, uh, you may uh, be keeping an eye out for a, a longer form webinar that our real estate team, our real estate litigation team, as a whole, maybe putting together because there's so much ground to cover. But to give us a teaser on that, based on our time crunch here, um, I, I want to introduce Elizabeth Schreiro. Thank you. Can you hear me, Sean? I can, yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for hanging in there. It's been a long session. I'll try to be brief. And if there are any questions, I encourage you to please read our Outlook brochure, which uh, has a long piece, and also reach out if you'd like to speak with me. I mean, as everyone probably knows from the popular press, uh, disruption in real estate caused by the pandemic and the recession continues, and recovery reflects acceleration of pre-pandemic trends, such as the rise of e-commerce and changing demands for the use of space, as well as some emerging trends, such as the growth of some brick-and-mortar retail operations that began online and increased use of shared spaces and multi-use of premises as well as new uses of commercial real estate. We anticipate an uptick in real estate litigation this year due to a variety of factors, including the return to customary pre-pandemic disputes, as well as the end of legislatively imposed moratoriums on enforcement of remedies against distressed tenants and owners, and the end of government-sponsored financial assistance and negotiated deferral and forbearance agreements coming to an end. Next slide, please. COVID-related rent disputes are really last year's news. 
some are still working their ways through the court, but essentially landlords have really won most of those cases. Courts have really held parties to the benefits of their bargains and their commercial leases and have denied tenants efforts to rely on common law doctrines or force majeure provisions in leases, which often carve out rent and require rent to be paid even in the, in the event of a force majeure event um, and have denied tenants efforts to get out of their rental obligations. The results have been a little bit uh, more mixed in the retail context. Uh, with some notable exceptions to that general rule, but th those are based on very particular lease language and usage of premises. Just uh, this year with the expiration of the temporary relief, as I said, and foreclosure moratoriums, we expect to see an, a rise in foreclosures and foreclosures are indeed now moving through the courts. We think that will also increase an uptick in bankruptcy filings, which were really at a low last year nationally um, due to parties having to resort to bankruptcy when, when government assistance and forbearance agreements and the like are no longer of help. Next slide, please. We think also that there will be disputes arising from the forbearance agreements and lease modifications that were entered during the pandemic, as well as disputes relating to US sanctions against Russia and other blocked parties. We've already seen some clients receive subpoenas from the Department of Justice asking about whether there are occupants in buildings um, of our clients who are on the blocked list. There was still will still continue to be some purchase and sale agreement disputes relating to pandemic impact. There will also be loan agreement disputes, lender liability claims and guarantee litigation and construction related disputes. Given the supply shortages and labor shortages, as well as inflation, that there will be many disputes arising under contracts that were signed some time ago and obligations under loan agreements, construction loan agreements, for example, um, and lease agreements that require construction to be completed by dates certain that are not going to be fulfilled. There will also probably be disputes relating to uh, mechanics lien litigation as well. Um, there are some other areas, and I'm just gonna try to zoom through this list um, that I see as developing areas of potential risk for real estate owners and companies. Uh, cybersecurity is a risk for real estate companies as has already been touched upon today as it is for other companies. Um, there's also the impact of ESG on real estate and disclosure requirements. And of course, climate change has a huge impact on um, real estate, not just the physical impact, but also disclosure obligations and due diligence obligations and proactive measures to be undertaken by owners and property measures, uh, property managers. In addition, commercial lease disputes are likely to arise in terms of the allocation of responsibility to address uh, climate change uh, modifications that are required to physical premises. ADA litigation will likely be on the rise due to the change in administrations and that also will lead not only to um, ADA litigation per se, but lease disputes where again, allocation of responsibility to adapt uh, will be an issue. Cannabis will also create an issue for real estate uh, parties. There will be novel disputes, I think, um, with the conflict in laws between federal laws and state laws and the uh, contours of what is permitted in states where cannabis recreational and medical use is permitted, but um, it's contrary to federal law, will create issues in terms of payment of rent in premises which are occupied by cannabis selling tenants and loan agreements with um, cannabis entities as well. And uh, one of the other news items from last year that will have ripple effects in the real estate world uh, across the country are structural integrity claims. 
in the in the wake of the Florida horrendous Florida condo collapse. Um, owners really have an obligation to be proactive to try to make sure that such collapses don't happen on their properties and on their watch. In, next slide. In conclusion, um, most real estate professionals who responded to CIFAR's 2022 real estate market sentiment survey indicated that they see 2022 as a year of opportunity for real estate companies as they navigate the fallout from the 2020 recession and the pandemic and adapt to new market demands. Continuing disruption in real estate, coupled with companies' continued optimism and the proliferation of new opportunities based on evolving uses and demands for space, also will result in increased real estate litigation since the prospects for financial rewards in a hot market will likely make real estate parties more willing to pursue litigation as a tool to achieve desired results. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you everyone, not only for joining us today, but for sticking with us to the end. One more time, the CLE code for this session is SS2763. And if anyone had questions uh, that we didn't have a chance to cover, please feel free to follow up and, and send me any inquiries or any reach out to any of the individual speakers on our panel from today. Uh, and we'd be happy to follow up then after today's webinar. Thanks again.